my name is Paul Scavo. Um, I am one of the two ed techs for the district. The other ed tech is Mr. Rob Appel. I used to be a teacher at Hardy Middle School, so Huskies, wherever Huskies are. One is, if you have your Chromebook, please raise your hand. Okay, now what you do, wait, wait, keep them up. Now what you do is you pat yourself on the back. If you notice, you have, we have set the standard of what to do. We expected you to come here prepared with a charged Chromebook. If you are wanting your students to do the same, you set that standard very, very early in the school year. All students will have a Chromebook that they get to use. So set that standard. Tell them, I expect that to happen. So make sure that you set it and they will follow that expectation. Technology has lots of pieces. Some of it helps you do your job better. Others help the students learn better. So you want to keep all of that straight and think to yourself, how can that technology be used to help me do my job, help the students learn? The ultimate goal is your students. Your job is to help your students learn to the best of their abilities. What technology do the students have? It's been mentioned, students have their own Chromebook. They, just like you, they're going to be taking it home. They're going to be coming back with it. You want to make sure that you are reminding them, did you charge it? Keep it charged. Because they come and it's going to be not charged. And you may have some loaners in your classroom that they can use. But you want to make sure that you remind them. If you're going to be using technology the next day, just give them a reminder. Hey, make sure you charge it because we've seen classrooms where students got the plugs all over the place and they're charging the device in the back and it's kind of a little safety hazard. So you want to make sure that you remind them as such. There are hotspots. So some students do not have internet at home. So we check out what are called hotspots so that they can access the network at home. All right, so this is a case-by-case -case basis of who gets these hotspots. Um, so again, the district has thought of that. We, we hear from the teachers, well, what about those students that don't have internet at home? We do surveys every year, and it's only about 15% of out of 15,000 students that don't have internet at home. That's a small portion. So that's what the hotspots are for. Uh, they also have an online access to their grades so that the parents and the students can see what their grades are outside of the school. There is one legality with posting grades outside of your classroom. Don't do it because the grades are associated with their student ID number and that is a confidential type of a piece. So we have been notified that posting those grades with the IDs is not allowed, okay? Because usually you're gonna post it alphabetically. So a student is gonna know where they fall in the alphabet and they're gonna be able to, oh, that student has that ID number right above me. And once they know that, they can start to cause issues. All right, so if you wish to have them see what their grade is, you have them go online and they can check their grade. You do have access to their passwords. Just don't go and pretend to be that student and start typing stuff to other people. Um, so yes, you do have access to their account information and their passwords. So when a student comes up to you and says, I don't know my password, and it will happen, you can actually see what their password is. All right. They were given the password at the beginning of the year. So it was mailed to them. The parents have a password. It was mailed to them. Okay, so parents have passwords and the students have password. All of that was given to them. But you know students, or if you don't, you will know students, and they are going to forget their passwords. Okay. For you guys, you got a big old list. I've been in the district long enough to know we had horrible Gerald, no offense, we had horrible um, connection 
Our network crashed often. Now we have access points, and we probably have one in here. So there's an access point, that little white device up there. Each and every single classroom has an access point. We have access points on the outside of buildings so that if they are in the quad area, they'd still be able to access whatever happens to be. We have a guest network. So the guest network is what you can connect to with your personal device so that you can have access to that anywhere on campus. All right. Um, we have network PCs. Every classroom has a PC as well as a document camera, as well as a projector. If you do not, you need to make sure that you're checking with your tech admin at your site and say, hey, school starts next week, you gotta make sure I'm ready to go. That is what we have purchased. Some of you, some lucky of you, actually have a interactive projector, which means that you can actually control your computer from the board. And you can draw on the board and you can save um, the annotations that you do on the board to a file. Okay, so um, again, not all of you have that. Eventually that's where we're gonna be going, but not right now. Some of you may have those. The Google Suite, so we have Google Applications for Education. You have unlimited storage. So I don't know if you've been in any other districts or if you have a Gmail account, you are limited to how much space you can save. With Google for Education, you have unlimited. You can store all your files that you may have, videos that you may be using for your classroom, a um, whole bunch of documents. Google Classroom is one of the things that you're gonna be looking at today. We have just started a piece that is talk, um, how it automatically creates your classrooms within Google Classroom. So we have a system that puts your students into the proper classes and it automatically updates that. So sometimes technology is really good, it does some things for you, all right? But you just gotta make sure you're comfortable using and that's what Rob and myself are for and the EdTechs to help you become comfortable. Um, student information, like I said, you get to challenge your brain. You're going to learn something this year, and then next year you're probably going to learn something new. So that just keeps our brains fresh. I always have a little saying, we don't have telephone numbers that we have to memorize. They're always stored in your phone, so we got to challenge you with some other memory type. So just learning how to do a technology is trying to keep your brain fresh. We also have what is called Blackboard Mass Communication. This is an automatic system that you can use to send messages home to parents and students. So this could be, hey, there is a test coming up um, and you can send out a message to the parents of your students to remind them that there is a test coming up. All right, so you'll learn about that down the road. Okay, so we're trying not to overload you with too many things, so I'm just telling you what you have available to you. There is what I like to call Chromebook refocusing software. It is software that you can use to monitor what your students are doing on your Chromebook. The district has a way to monitor what the students are doing on their Chromebook anywhere. Even if they're at their home network, we have a software that monitors it and we take action if there is any inappropriate material or inappropriate action by a student. You can let your students know the district can monitor wherever you are. So use it as a tool. Um, in your classroom, we do have two softwares that you can use so you can monitor what your students are doing and you can send out websites to them. You can communicate with them within your classroom if you happen to be doing something at your desk and you need to check with what your students are doing. We have what is called Land School, and we also have what is called Go Guardian Teacher. Those two systems, um, one is more fancier than the other, so we're going to be again messaging you what those different devices or different softwares are. Um, and support. You have lots and lots and lots of support. Ask teachers next to you in your classroom. Ask teachers that you see in your PLC. You can email, you can talk to us, you can check with your ed tech. So there are multiple, multiple people that you can ask. We are here to support you. 
All right, so I want to make sure that you feel comfortable using it. So ask. That's all you have to do. Yes? You would recommend that person to your administration. So either your AP um, in charge of technology would be the person you would check with. So that person would pull in that student or would check with the counselor and they would determine if, yes, they actually do need it. Thank you. Good question. All right. Any other things? Do you guys feel like you got a lot of stuff that you can work with? Don't feel overwhelmed. Just use it simply at first. Yes? Yes, so um, they log on. Know how you logged on to your Google account? They have a Google account. It's, they use their student ID to log into it, and that's how we know what student is which. Um, we, it's whatever is with their account, we can check. So that's what the administrative piece would be. We can check whenever they're using that and what they're doing. All right, good question. Yes? Uh, I have another question. Uh, you mentioned GoGuardian. So uh, if I'm more comfortable with GoGuardian, can I use it as my personal tool? And are there any limitations uh, in time that I can use GoGuardian at home or in the classroom during the test? Are there any limitations? So, um, yes, so the, with the GoGuardian, if you're comfortable using it, you can use GoGuardian over Land School or you can use them in conjunction. That may start to cause overlapping issues, but you would usually just stick with one of them. And any of those technical glitches, let's wait until you see them before I try to troubleshoot them ahead of time. So, yes, we want to make sure that you are comfortable with whatever system we have. All right, great questions. I appreciate you guys asking. All right, next. Okay, so you have accessing of our systems on the outside. So when you're in the campus, if you start any of your devices, you're going to go, like on your teacher computer, there are three tabs. So when you signed in onto these machines, you had three different tabs that opened up automatically. You had our district web page, you had the Gmail, and you had the staff portal. The staff portal is what you access a lot of our software from. So you can access the staff portal by either of those two. The top one is our district web page. The bottom one is specifically our staff portal. Now, when you are accessing these or your gradebook or student information system, like at Starbucks, I suggest not because that is a public Wi-Fi and you start to get into issues with public Wi-Fi's because if you start to go in and you just click on I accept to use the internet properly and you don't put in a code or any security to get onto the Wi-Fi you start to have vulnerabilities of someone accessing the information about the students so I suggest never to access your eSchool information from a public Wi-Fi. So just be very conscious of when you connect to the district or connect to a Wi-Fi, you know which one it is. The Chromebooks are pretty fail-safe. The viruses don't attack them because it's an OS that people don't really bother. The um, Chromebook automatically updates itself. You don't have to worry about viruses. We have a filtering system that's built in. So again, you really don't need to worry too much about uh, viruses with the Chromebooks. Um, we have never had any issues with it. It's built pretty safe. Okay. Uh -oh. When you log in, know how you logged on to your Chromebook? You had to put your at salinasuhsd.org. So just be aware when you're logging in outside of the district, you may have to put that for your email. 
That's the only thing that you have to just keep in mind. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. So I'm at a coffee shop and doing my schoolwork and sending email and, and doing such, such as Starbucks or whatever. So so if you're just doing emails to kind of keep up with, hey, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there, as long as you are not transmitting any student information, which you shouldn't be doing through the email anyway, um, but it's just quick messages, great. As soon as you start to access the student information system, the eSchool, that's where you're not supposed to be doing that. Yes? No, because when you're at home, you have a password, right? Because you set up your Wi-Fi so that there is a code that you enter to gain access. When you start to enter a code, that's secure. When you go to Starbucks, you just hit OK, I agree to use it. So that's the difference that you want to make sure that you're recognizing. OK, I appreciate the questions. Yes? No. Um, so again, most of the information that you're going to be doing during your email is just pretty generic and you don't really need to worry about the security aspect of that. When you start to transmit grades, addresses, any of those very detailed about the student, that's what you don't want to be doing. So there is, we don't have any encryption on the email to say, hey, this is now going to be encrypted. So. Mm -hmm. Right. So within, when you send it to another teacher or administrator that has our same um, email address and you're at school, that's fine. So I'm, the thing I'm worried about is outside of the school network when you connect to a public Wi-Fi. That's the issue. Um, they could, yes. Um, and most of the information, if it's in eSchool, because you, we upload documents pertaining to students through the, e the um, system, our eSchool system, and there's comments and co or, uh, documents that can be uploaded. That's where you would most likely be doing that for those students. Okay. You guys are asking very good questions. All right. Um, oh, yes. Um, yes. So we only can look at your emails. We don't know what you are doing, per se, on your device. So, and it's only when you log in onto your particular um, email account. And we have five techs for uh, lots and lots of people. We're not going to be looking and, oh, look at that. Um, it's only if there is an issue that does come up. And we are required by law to pull up the records of someone that was doing something with their email or something like these devices. So these devices are district-owned devices. So if we notice that something gets flagged, that this device is being used inappropriately, then yeah, we can check. But we, we have, I think we've maybe done that once over the last 10 years. And that was because it was a, a law. It was uh, police officers came and they said we have a warrant to grab that information. But yeah, it is possible, but we don't do that very often unless there's a need. Okay? All right. A um, couple other things. You have my documents, which you're going to start to see when you work on your desktop computer. These are files that are saved on the actual device. Okay, don't be doing that very much because if your device crashes, they just wipe it clean and start fresh. So if you've saved anything on your desktop, it won't be there if you have an issue with the Chromebook. You have what is called Google Drive. 
Google Drive is where you would be storing your documents and files and lessons and all that stuff, which is encrypted and you have permissions to share, not share. Okay, so the Google Drive, you have unlimited storage space. On your device, you will have um, some limitations. So just be aware that's where we're kind of leaning people to. You can save stuff on your desktop. It would still be there, but if, again, if something was to happen to your computer, there was some glitch and then it, it crashed, they just wipe everything clean and then they start again. There is a My Documents, which you can save some information, but just be, have a backup in My Drive. Yes? You can, but we have, on these devices, we have limited USB ports, so you may not have a port, a USB port to actually plug it in, but yeah, you're allowed to use it. Um, just, just be aware that you also want to have a backup in case that external drive fails. So again, that's where I'm pushing the Google Drive um, because it, I, it's, yeah, it's, it goes anywhere. You can access that from anywhere. You don't have to have that drive anywhere. Okay, all right. Okay, Chromebooks. All right, so go ahead and start looking at your Chromebooks. Log in if you haven't done so. Let's get you kind of working on the devices. And no, we are not paid by Chrome to advertise any of this stuff. It just is very convenient and easy. Um, these devices are about $200. So they are very reasonable to maintain and to own. So that's why Chromebooks. They are very, very similar to what the students be, are using, except for the flip screen. Some students have um, those in specific classrooms, but most are just basic um, Chromebooks. All right. They have very long battery life. You're hopefully going to notice today it should last throughout the whole day. Um, hopefully you did bring your charger just in case. Yes? Okay, with technology, always have a plan B. Correct? So just be on the safe side. You never know. So always have a plan B just in case that technology breaks or doesn't quite work. Um, also make sure that you check when you're doing your lessons, are you gonna be using the technology? Test it ahead of time. Have a student test what you're gonna do. Like if there's links or anything, because we have filtering system built in and we get calls saying, I can't access this website, it works for the teacher, but it may not work for the student. So you want to make sure that you check with a student, hey, can I have you just go to this website the day before to make sure that they can actually get to where you want to go. All right, so just think ahead. If I'm going to be using the technology, think of all the scenarios. Again, keeping your brain sharp. Okay, I mentioned automatic updates. So you don't have to think about, is it updated? It's going to automatically update itself. Um, it's going to have a similar interface as the students. There is a web store. What I want you to go to is the bottom left. It is what is called, I believe, the finder or the search. Oh, launcher. They change it. Google's famous for changing things, and then they just, here it is. Here's the new change. Okay, so the finder. Web store. So go ahead and click on the web store. Students can add any apps. You can add any apps. We don't limit the apps. Yes? OK, so some of you may have to put on all apps. Oh, um, down at the very bottom. And all apps. And web store. And you have two tabs, so it may, oh, I saw it. Web store. Okay, so we're going to just kind of be walking around, just seeing that you can get to the web store, just to see what's there. Check with your elbow partner, make sure that they are there.
Oh, um, did you get to the web store? So go to the Finder, and if you don't see it here, go to All Apps, and then the Web Store. Oh, very good. You're ready to check in your classes, or you just started to see? Okay, did you find the Web Store? I'm sorry, I had a district email last year because I was a substitute, uh -huh. um, and then I would work with my cousins for a lot, so it doesn't like automatically pop up with the website. Your email? No, yeah, well, I'm here now. Oh, on this? Yeah, yeah, it should have the three... I went there, but it didn't automatically pop up. Is that an issue? I mean, I'm sure I could figure it out. Um, on this, you mean it, on, it didn't it pop up? It pop up. Quickly. Right, right. So on your desktop machine, it's going to pop up. On oh, these, okay. it right. does not. When you guys are done before you break for the different rooms, mm -hmm. could you kind of give me a second to make an announcement? Sure. Um, I need to have Blanca make an announcement. She's going to pull some of my math teachers to find out. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pause you there for a second, please. Thank you. That was pretty quick. I appreciate that. My students, they, they knew when I was up here, they better zip it or else I give them that evil eye. And... All right. Um, you notice that we use Google Apps. Um, Word and PowerPoint and Excel and all that, in a couple years, we won't have that because it costs lots and lots of money to renew those licenses. So we're not limiting you to Google. You can still use Word or um, PowerPoint or Excel. It is on your desktop machine. But just be aware, if you're going to be in the district for multiple years, it probably won't be there in several years. You can convert Word documents to Google documents really easily, so um, that's why we're kind of leaning towards that. We don't pay for the Google applications, so that's where it saves us quite a bit of money. All right, some shortcuts. You're going to notice I don't see a right click. So on these, how you do a right click is to kind of like my little um, visual, two fingers separated and you push down together, that's going to be right click. All right, so just a little helpful hint. Two fingers separated, push down together, right click. On, On the touchpad? <laughs> uh, also, you should have noticed up at the very top, you have some buttons and uh, features. You have volume. You have um, the brightness. You have screenshots and so forth. Okay, so you have those tools on the very top. Delete. You're going to notice there is no delete on the keyboard, but there actually is. If you hit Alt, Backspace, that is the delete key. Alt, Backspace. So backspace goes to the left, delete deletes what's coming to the right. All right, so just some helpful hints. Cap locks, your students are going to do this sometimes. They're going to love to type in all caps. And they're going to say, I don't know how, to, how I did that. It was by the alt and the little magnifying glass that would be where your cap locks key would be. And if you look in the bottom right, it's going to say cap locks, and it will have a little arrow. Okay, so that's where you want to deselect that. All right. Okay. Brightness and volume, a top row. All on the top row of the keyboard. All right, next piece, very quickly. Hardware and software issues. First, 
check with your connections. I don't know if any of you watched the IT crowd, um, the little British series. Okay, so their famous saying is, have you turned it on? Have you restarted it? Have you plugged it in? So just check that first. Restarting usually corrects a lot of the issues. So just restart the machine and see if that helps. Check the connections, make sure that they're plugged in. Um, check the cap locks. We have a lot of people that say, my password's not working, my password's not working, and their cap locks is on. All right, so just double check before starting to call. Slow down, take a breath, check it, and it probably will work. If that doesn't work, then call 7070. 7070 is our help desk. Instructional. We do have built-in tutorials. So when you go to Chrome on your desktop or on the Chromebook, you're going to see a little question mark in the green or in the multi-circle. That is built-in tutorials that you can look at to help you learn about it. Or Google search. This is a Google product, so just do a Google search for what you want and something is going to show up for you. You can also go to our YouTube channel that has videos. So Rob and myself create tutorial videos at that help.suhsdtech.org and you'll get to our YouTube channel that has all the different videos on how to do various things in our district. If you have things instructional, that's where your instructional coaches and your ed techs are going to come in and they're going to help you work on creating those lessons that are going to get your students to learn. You can also contact Rob and myself. All right, so we're able to help you with all sorts of manners. So use us. Check with your ed tech, check with us. Okay, um, in your document, don't have to look at it now, but in your book, booklet, in the green papers, there is this little handout that talks about if your computer is not set up. The maintenance guys do a really good job, but sometimes um, the room is, and they haven't had a chance to get things set up. So there is a document that tells you how to kind of get your system set up. So there is, it's pretty simple to plug in the different cables and just connect it if you really need to. Okay, contractual, your teacher contract has things specific for technology. One is you are to be maintaining our district grade book at least entering grades every two weeks. That's the minimum. All right, so we use eSchool. Whatever the district approved grade book is in the future, it's still going to be every two weeks. That's the minimum that you need to be entering grades. Some people do it. When I was teaching math, I did my grades every single night. So it depends on what you're doing, but you want to make sure that you're updating it because it's communication for your parents and students. They want to check to see, well, how am I doing? Also, you're going to get emails. You're going to get lots of emails. So all that you are required with your district is you need to review them and either respond saying, hey, I'm going to get to this, but you need to acknowledge that, hey, I've seen my emails. If it's from a parent, you have two work days to respond to the parents. Okay, so this could just be, hey, I received your message. I will get back to you at a certain time. At least you acknowledge to the parent. Those of you that are parents and you've emailed teachers, it's nice to say, yes, they actually got it and I'm going to take care of it. So you've got to acknowledge that you are, um, got it, that email from the parent. All right, so, yes? Um, are it, I haven't used this before. Is eSchool and the Google Classroom linked so that you're not having to enter grades twice? Uh, they are not linked in that manner. The the e school is the grade that gets reported to the homes, and that's where it's pulled. So yes, we don't have a way of linking them yet. That doesn't mean we won't in the future, but right now it's not. Thank you. Okay, just some last pieces. So technology is a tool. Um, it is to help you reach your learning goal. 
And I tried to think of all the wonderful acronyms that you, if you do not know, you will know. So we have multiple tools and strategies to help. CC, Common Core, NGSS, Next Generation Science Standards, um, CM, Constructing Meaning, um, GRR, Gradual Release of Responsibility. All of these are district initiatives to help you create those great lessons to get your students to learn. Um, PBIS, believe it or not, PBIS, Positive Behavioral, uh, thank you, Intervention um, System. So a great student, well behaved, is going to learn a lot better than ones that are not. PBIS to help that going forward. <laughs> and thank you. Um, PLCs, professional learning communities. Um, IC is our instructional coaches, and of course, the technology to help you. All right, so focus on a well developed lesson. Think through the student outcomes that you want to reach, and think how can I have technology, if it's appropriate, reach that learning goal. So clearly technology helps our students and us be more creative. Students can make videos, they can create graphics, they can make music, they can do all kinds of things. They can also think critically. They can establish or they can look for just about anything they want to find. And it's up to us to teach them how to analyze that information. So thinking critically about a whole variety of topics is, is something they can do. They can also collaborate. So we're using, and we can collaborate with them. We're using today's Meet right now, which is a very powerful technology tool for collaboration. There's also communication. Students can communicate in a very powerful way. I'm thinking of websites, right? Basically, the internet is a medium for communication, and students can do that in a very rich and powerful way. There's also assessment. Yesterday, you heard from the Director of Assessment, Research, and Accountability, Bobby Cannon. And um, when I think about assessment, I think about feedback. Technology gives us the, the promise of providing kids with real-time feedback, and it gives us that, that holy grail of differentiation meeting the kids where their needs are, and, and personalizing instruction. I think technology offers that as well. Classroom management, there's classroom management tools that we can use uh, that are technology-based. And there's productivity, right? Technology should make us more productive and more efficient as well. And of course, digital citizenship. We have to talk about digital citizenship. So for the, the duration of this last part of the general session, I'm going to be focusing on those four C's, those first four C's you see over there, creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. And I'm also going to be focusing on digital citizenship. And this is driven out of data, data that we have. A lot of the initiatives, perhaps all of the initiatives in the district, are couched in data. So every year we survey to see how we're doing with our initiatives. Educational technology now is a huge initiative in the district. And these are, these are couched, like I said, in data. And I know it's not showing up entirely clearly, but what this is, I mean, you can see the colors, right? And what we're looking at here is called the case framework. And the case framework is kind of the boilerplate or the header information for the data set from the Breitbart survey, which this district does to measure its implementation of technology in the district. And so the, the Bright Bites data presents this thing called the case framework. The case framework stands for classroom, which is the C. And you can see there's a score there, right, represented by that color wheel. And then access, which is another score that we get represented by that green color wheel. And then skills and environment, so case. And if you look at that, so take a moment to look at that case framework and those color wheels. It's giving us a direction. It's giving us a how we need to focus our efforts in regards to technology. Yeah, or alternatively, probably the best thing to do because the, I think the visual is a little low, is to go to the back channel, click on the link for the presentation, and follow along. I'm about on slide 20, I think. 17. 17, thank you very much. So if you go to the back channel, I think the, if you go to the bottom, probably the last, the last entry there is going to be this presentation. Okay, so let's get back to the case framework. And I can talk about it if you can't see it so clearly. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. But in any case, the case framework points out, I think that... Okay. The case framework points out that class, the classroom domain is the one that 
I think the classroom domain is probably the most important, right? It's the teaching and learning that happens in the classroom. And you, that is where we need to focus our efforts. And so within that, if you look into the subdomains, if you look in the subdomains for this, there's two subdomains that really stand out. And they are digital citizenship and the four C's. And you can see those were represented also in those eight focus areas that I talked about earlier. So we're going to spend some time talking about digital citizenship. And the good news is this isn't new for us. We've been at this for a couple years. And we've shown growth. In fact, I'm proud to announce that this year, uh, for the first time, we were recognized for our, our efforts in digital, digital, digital citizenship by Common Sense Education. Common Sense recognizes districts who have innovative practices in digital citizenship instruction to their students. And last year we earned this, so hats off to us and uh, hats off to the district. This is going to continue. You will hear more about digital citizenship. We have district-wide initiatives. Our goal is that every year all of our students get at least, at least two lessons in digital citizenship. Okay. Of course, there's, even though we got that recognition, there's still work to be done. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a quote here from someone perhaps very famous to help tell that story. Of course, that's true, right? Was it Roosevelt that said that? OK. <laughs> All right, so true. You know, one of the challenges our students have in regards to digital citizenship is being able to discern and evaluate the information they find online. And I think this, this slide really gets at that. So this is certainly one, one focus area for us. Um, and this is some data. This is some data that backs that up. We're probably about, at the, in the national average, last year Stanford did a study about how well kids can evaluate and critically think about the information they find online. And, I and we found from our data set that it was right in line with the national average, maybe even a little, bit of a, a little bit of a head of that. If you look at the numbers up here, the first number represents our high school students. The second number represents our middle school students. And what really stands out to me is that second one, where it says 32% of high school students say they know how to evaluate the accuracy of information they find online, and only 22% of middle school students. And that's staggering. So it's, all, it's incumbent upon all of us to take that on and make sure, you know, we have this tremendous resource, the web, the internet, these tools, but to make sure they're also, that our students are also using them in a way that um, sourcing and finding information that's valuable and critically analyzing that so that it, not only is it that it makes sense, but they're looking at, they're looking at stuff that's true and verifiable. We don't, do you ever when you're teaching, or when, when you're teaching, it's always good, I think, to also show non-examples. So here's, here's where we don't want our students. This is what we don't want our students to be like. Okay. All right, so non-examples are powerful, right? And that's not what we want our students to turn into. All right, and in, in, in all kidding aside, there's, there's some serious implications for misuse of digital tools and social media, and I, we're all aware of that. And I, I've, uh, I've pulled some headlines here, and you've probably seen these. We need to also protect our kids. We don't want, we don't want our kids to undergo any of this. This is traumatic. A lot of these, some of these, I think at least three of these headlines are from incidences that happened in California, some of them not too far from here. And we want to make sure that not only are we protecting the kids who are on the receiving end of cyberbullying, but we're also keeping our kids who might engage in that activity from doing it. Just yesterday, as I was setting up, there were some students outside the room. They are going, oh, this is what she said to me online, and this, and this, and this, and this. It's happening all the time. We don't always catch it. We don't always capture it in the headlines, but it's happening all the time. Okay? My kids, my 11-year-old, my 13-year-old, they've been exposed to this. Okay, so this is real, and it's important that we, uh, that we prepare our kids to deal with not only the good, but also the bad of, of technology. Okay, so the reality is, right, that our students, it's not just a list of don'ts. We don't want, you know, it's like, 
don't go on Twitter, don't go on Facebook, don't go on Google+, don't go on YouTube. Well, we might be able to say that at school, right, if we wanted to, but in reality, our kids are going to do this no matter what. They're going to do this on their personal time, and you know what? They're going to do this in their work lives, too. If we truly want to prepare our kids, one of our goals you heard yesterday was to prepare our kids to be um, not only lifelong learners, but also uh, to be college and career ready. If we're going to prepare them to be career ready, they, know how to, they need to know how to navigate the web, navigate social media in a productive way. Right? They, we have to teach them to use these tools productively and positively. Right? Overwhelm the bad with the good. And they can do that with social media. And the next story I'm going to share with you is a story that speaks to that. It's overwhelming the bad. Actually, it's just, it's just beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful story of using technology to connect. OK, so that, that gets me every time. I was kind of choking up beforehand. But um, the, uh, it's powerful, right? Technology, can over, we can overwhelm the bad with the good. And clearly, there's a good here, OK? Powerful good. All right, so the next part, we're going to head into, uh, we're going to head into a, talking about the four C's. So digital citizenship is clearly important, and we want to reinforce that in our classrooms. But also the other area, and there's other subdomains here to talk about as well, but the four C's are really important. And um, in a moment, I'm going to ask that you re-engage with your partner. I want, before you leave here today, I want to make sure that you know the four C's, so there's going to be like a low-stress pop quiz, okay? So uh, be ready for that. That's coming up. So I just want you to be able to recite recite what the four C's are. So the four C's again are creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. Creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and uh, what? Communication, right? I always, I, I'm good with three, and once I get to four, it's, it becomes a little bit more difficult. So are you ready? Are you ready to t recite these to your partner? Okay, the four C's are, go ahead. Okay, so I, I heard it. So four C's, creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. All right, so the, the, the challenge though for us is to, how do we reinforce these skills? And these skills are often referred to as 21st century skills, but really we're 20 years almost into the 21st century, so these are really life skills. Okay, so let's just call them life skills. That's what they are. The, um, there's a nice video here that I'm gonna share with you that really talks about reinforcing those in the classroom. Like, what does creativity look like in the classroom? I've already given a couple examples, but this video is going to do a better job. Collaboration, critical thinking, and communication. What does that look like? So there's some nice examples here that hopefully can ins will inspire me and hopefully will inspire you as well. OK, so that, I thought that video is nice because it highlights the four C's and gives some practical applications of what they are. Now, that's not to say that the four C's don't happen without technology. Of course they do. My dad, who is a 40-year educator, 40-year world history, world history and US history teacher, he was using the four C's, even though if he thought every piece of technology was PowerPoint. Okay? He was using technology. He was just doing it in a different way. Okay? But the point is, technology helps us amplify, what's, amplify those four C skills, those life skills. Right? Students can be more creative. We can be more collaborative with them. They can communicate in very powerful and rich ways. And of course, they can think critically about anything that they want to think about. OK, so we have some tools for you that help, will, are going to help explore those four C's and maybe hopefully start think, will help uh, prod some thinking about some ideas you might be able to incorporate. So for the next uh, 10 or so minutes, I'm going to invite you to explore with your critical friend again, your partner uh, at your table. Um, some of those four C's, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to model that for you, but if you want to get a head start on that, if you go to the, that address right there, and if we could put that address in the back channel, so when Paul puts that address in the back channel, you don't even have to type it in, you could just click on it, it's going to be at the very top of the list, provided no one else is contributing to that back channel, so you can either type that in or go to the Today's Meet back channel and pull that up, and then uh, once you get there, I'm going to guide you through an activity where we're going, to, we're going to dive into those four C's. And um, whoever is moderating the back channel, if you want to drop that link in there too. So the directions are one, go to bit.ly, a lot of bit.ly's today, forward slash 4C Explore. And that's going to pull up this page, the page we're looking at right now. Number two is working with a partner, find a creativity tool that looks interesting. So you're going to have to make a pretty quick decision about that. And 
just check it out. Right now, I was going to ask that you type some stuff in, but I think because we're running low on time, I just want you to explore it. Just explore it with your partner. Have a conversation about a tool that looks interesting. So let me do that now. I'm going to open up this page, because I think I'm going to wrap things up now, because it's, we're drawing near on time anyway. So know that that tool is available to you. It's in the back channel. But one thing I want to point out, and uh, I set things up perfectly with all the challenges we had up front. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Is that when you're using new technology, when you're using new strategies, and when you're using new things, there's going to be, there's going to be, there's going to be failures. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be times where you're just like, oh my goodness, what's going on? The audio's not working, or that app's not working, or my kids aren't all getting on that same page. They can't see the link. The resolution for the slides isn't clear because the room's lighter than I thought it was going to be. You know, it's not as dark as I thought it was going to be. So there's going to be challenges. And you're going to confront that probably with technology at some point. You're going to confront that in when you try to implement some of the strategies that you're learning about, GRR, CM. You're going to learn about a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of new things. And there's going to be challenges. And my point is, and the point I want to make to you and the point I want to leave you with is that persevere. Use those challenges as opportunities to iterate and get better. Fail forward. Okay, so um, people I've heard for years, failure is an option. Failure is not an option, but it is. The best thinking comes out of failure, I think. Success comes out of failure. If you fail forward and, are, and you challenge yourself to use that as an opportunity to learn more, it becomes an opportunity. So I have up here, I have a graphic that shows, and it's going to start again in a moment. This shows the lunar program in the United States. And you can look at the dates, the launch dates right here. I've been reading about this recently, and it's amazing how many failures the lunar program, NASA's lunar program had. And if you keep going down, it's scrolling down through the dates, it becomes more successful over time. Until ultimately in the late 60s and the early 70s, what do we find? All those, all those failures built on themselves to a point of success. Such that we're at the end, in the, in the early 70s, we have a man on the moon and there is, we've had tremendous success. So remember this, in all these new initiatives, you're, it's, probably, it's probably overwhelming in some sense, right? And there's going to be challenges. We saw challenges this morning, right? Challenges with the presentation. You might encounter some of those yourself. But know that if you use those as an opportunity to get better, you persevere, fail forward, you're going to have a great year. Okay? And, I, and I look forward to working with you for the rest of today. I look forward to uh, working with you this year and, and beyond. Thank you very much.